All right, let's go ahead and get started. First of all, welcome to the Biolab Fundamentals webinar part one. My name is Eric Morgan, and I'm a software engineer with MindWare Technologies, and I'm going to be presenting this webinar today. The webinar is going to be split into two main parts. There's going to be a walkthrough, which will be the majority of the webinar. And we're going to start by introducing Biolab, the application, what it does and what it's used for. We're going to talk about some basic data acquisition concepts, such as sample rate, gain, and filtering, among others, and how they work in Biolab. We're going to talk about the various modes of operation in Biolab, how they work, and how to use them effectively in your study. And we're going to go over the channel setup and previewing data. Following this walkthrough, there's going to be about a 15-minute section for question and answers at the end. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to ask them using the GoToWebinar interface. And we're not going to be answering the questions as they come in, but rather we'll be queuing them up and we'll answer them all at once at the end in the Q&A portion. So if you don't hear your question answered right away, don't worry. You've probably received it and we'll get to it at the end. So we'll start with a brief introduction to Biolab and, and what it does. Biolab is the free data acquisition and file viewing application for Mindware. So if you're collecting data in Biolab, or if you're collecting data using Mindware data acquisition hardware, you're probably using Biolab at some point. So Biolab can acquire data from our Bionex desktop hardware line. It can connect, collect data from the Mindware mobile uh, ambulatory impedance cardiograph. It can be used to integrate with other systems through triggering and events. And we can also record synchronous audio video recordings in Biolab. In addition to the data acquisition side of things, Biolab can also be used as a file viewer. So you can review your data in Biolab. You can do some very basic analysis. You can also enter events post-acquisition to help define points of interest for data analysis that you may not have been able to add during acquisition. And finally, <clears throat> you can export data using Biolab into a simple-to-read text-based format if you want to do any of your own custom analysis outside of the application. And since we just released a new version, I want to take a moment and sort of highlight some of the new features we have in the latest release of Biolab, which is 3.3. We now have integration with Noldis Media Recorder, which is a powerful audio-video recording solution that allows us to interface with digital cameras and a number of video sources that we weren't able to in the past. We can now control Biolab using a network interface. So there's a knowledge base article on our support site that details how this works, but basically you can send commands to Biolab using uh, MATLAB or some other application that's capable of doing so <clears throat> to control start, stop, and add events into your data acquisition. We could take events from the MyWare mobile over Wi-Fi now. So using the A and B buttons on the mobile, if you're using that, you can now tag those events in Wi-Fi in Biolab. And we have improved support for user configuration files. So in the past, it was difficult to share files between computers, between users. Now we have improved support so that you can share a configuration file with a colleague that has a similar setup and reuse some of these configurations more effectively. <clears throat> so if you haven't already, you can go to our download site at support.mywaretech.com slash downloads, and you can download the latest release. Okay, moving on, we're going to first talk about how you would launch Biolab. So there's a couple ways you can do that. You can either click on the desktop icon, which is on the right here, or you can go to the start menu, and under the Mindware folder, <clears throat> you'll find the Biolab 3.3 shortcut, as well as a shortcut for the user guide. So once you click on it and you open Biolab, the first thing you're going to see is a splash screen. And this screen is going to be initializing the application, initializing communications with some of the devices that you have connected that you're planning on acquiring data with. And this will stay up here for a few seconds. If you're collecting data with a MindWare mobile, the screen you're going to see immediately after the splash screen is the network device detection screen. I'm not going to talk about this very much today because we do have a pretty extensive YouTube video that talks about how the MyWare mobile connection process takes place. So, so please do view that if you have any questions about that. But whether you're using a mobile or you're using a Bionex, you're always going to end up in the same place, which is the Biolab configuration screen. 
And it's only going to look slightly different based on whether you have uh, mobile or a Bionex as your acquisition source. And this is where we're going to be spending the majority of our time today in the webinar. And actually mainly on this first tab, which is the channel setup tab. So we're going to be talking about the controls across the top of the screen and how to set up your channels in the tab below. And we'll start sort of moving left to right across the top of the screen and we're going to talk about sample rate. Samples are the individual data points that make up a signal. The sample rate is the rate at which you're grabbing those data points on the incoming signal and those are defined as samples. And sample rate is typically expressed in samples per second, or hertz. Sometimes it's also referred to as sample frequency. And in BioLab, all channels are sampled at the same rate. Some systems that you might be familiar with collected different signals at different sample rates depending on the type of signal that you're collecting and what sample rate was required to see meaningful characteristics of the signal. Um, but in MindWare, in BioLab, we collect all of our data at the same sample rate to ensure that we're getting quality and sufficient sampling for all of your data. And additionally, the reduced sample rate can save on file size, but in reality, the cost of file storage these days is pretty inexpensive. So you don't really gain a lot by by changing your sample rate around per channel. <clears throat> to help illustrate the effects of sample rate, we're going to take a look at this example ECG signal. So the top ECG has been collected at 1,000 hertz. And again, these points would actually be a lot closer together if it were actually at 1,000 hertz. Uh, this is more of an artistic representation. But you can see there's more data points on the upper signal than the lower one. And when we look at that waveform, we could see a consistent morphology with the ECG. We could see a well-defined R peak, which is this uh, high peak in the ECG. We could see the QRS complex, the, the, the lower amplitude components. And when we're collecting ECG, whether it's for heart rate variability analysis or impedance cardiography analysis or even just heart rate, it's important to accurately identify when a beat occurred, and we're using that R peak, that sharp peak, to identify that. If we look at the lower waveform, we can see that the morphology is not consistent across various cardiac cycles. We can see that the peak is not well defined. <clears throat> sometimes, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, sometimes it almost looks flat. And that's because we aren't sampling enough to catch the actual R peak of the signal. And so the actual peak is occurring, you know, some point between the two points on the peak. And because of this, we're not getting an accurate representation of when a beat occurred in terms of milliseconds. And we need millisecond accuracy when we're analyzing for heart rate variability or cardiac impedance. So to be safe, you should always acquire your data at 500 samples a second, but 1,000 is better. And for higher frequency signals like EMG or EEG, even higher sample rates are preferred. One thing to note is that the MindWare Mobile is fixed at 500 samples per second. So you won't be able to change that. But 500 samples per second is sufficient for all of the data that you would collect using a MindWare Mobile. But otherwise, when in doubt, just acquire your data at 1,000 samples per second. Okay, next, we're going to move on to triggering. As I mentioned earlier, BioLab can be integrated with external systems. And one of the ways that we do this is through triggering. Triggering is used to synchronize the start times of multiple data acquisition systems. And this can really improve your analysis experience when you're working with data from multiple sources. Instead of having to worry about the offset of the start from one system to the next, you can know that all of your data started at the same time, and so you can analyze it as such. Some common trigger sources include stimulus presentation packages such as ePrime, SuperLab, or DirectRT. You can use MATLAB to write custom scripts that trigger and send events to BioLab. And the Nolus Observer software for behavioral monitoring is also a supported trigger source for MindWare. And the way these triggers come in is through a Bionex, through the trigger input on the back. 
and we sell a couple of cables depending on the system you're using to trigger BioLab. But in reality, you wouldn't even need to use one of these cables if you had another system that wasn't compatible with it. You could use a custom cable to just attach to the trigger input port and send that trigger signal. So if you're only using MyWare Mobiles for data acquisition, uh, there aren't any triggering options. But if you're using a Bionex, then you'll be familiar with this. And there are a number of trigger modes that are available in BioLab. And the reason for this is not all systems work the same. And some systems, which are capable of sending triggers, aren't flexible in the type of trigger that they can send. So in BioLab, we try to accommodate all of the different trigger types that could exist. And these include rising, falling, pause low level, and pause high level. We have a few diagrams that will help illustrate what those mean. So in rising trigger mode, BioLab is going to be waiting to see a rising edge on the trigger inline to start acquisition. And once it sees that rising edge, data is going to begin to be acquired. And falling edge is sort of the opposite. It's going to wait until the level at the trigger import changes from 5 volts to 0 volts. And then it's going to start acquiring data. These are the most common modes that are used when triggering from stimulus presentation systems. The two additional modes that are available allow for a lot more control over all acquisition rather than just starting acquisition. So with pause high, it's going to look for any time that the trigger inline is high, and it's going to stop acquisition at that point. So you're in complete control at this point of when acquisition starts and stops, as opposed to rising and falling mode when you're only in control of when acquisition starts. And pause low is, of course, the opposite of pause high when the trigger line is low acquisition is paused. So triggering is definitely something that you should look into if you're working with external systems that are capable of sending a trigger because it can make analysis a lot nicer knowing that all of your data was started at the same time. Okay, we're going to move on from triggering now and talk a little bit about acquisition mode and file mode. And we skipped a few settings in the middle. I'm going to come back to them because they aren't quite as important. So we're going to talk about acquisition mode and file mode together because they're sort of connected to one another. We have two acquisition modes, continuous and epic mode. And we have three file modes, append, write over, and auto name. The file modes mostly pertain to continuous mode, which is what we'll talk about first. And in epic mode, the file mode is always auto name because epic mode takes control of naming files for you. We'll start by talking about the different modes that are available in continuous mode. And again, I have a few diagrams to help illustrate them. The first mode we'll talk about is write over mode. In this mode, the way it works is if you start an acquisition and you stop it in the same session. If you were to start a new acquisition, it's going to immediately start writing over the data that you had just recorded. Generally, this mode is not used very often. And it's a little dangerous if you're not sure that you're in this mode, so I would recommend using one of the other modes unless you have good reason to use write-over mode, but that's what it does. Append mode allows you to start and stop acquisition multiple times during the same acquisition session. And it will take those separate acquisitions and append them or concatenate them in a single data file, which you've named. And so with this mode, if you have stopped and started your data multiple times in that session, you're going to end up with discontinuities in your data. But what's nice is we put an event when those discontinuities occur so that you know when you're analyzing that there's been some gap in time here that's not accounted for, that data was not recorded during. And, and you could consider that event when determining your segments for analysis. But this way you can have multiple portions of time that have a gap between them stored in the same file. And the last file mode is auto name, which is similar to append mode in that you can start and stop data acquisition multiple times in a session, but instead of concatenating them and putting them into one file, you're going to get multiple files for each start of data acquisition, but with a number appended to the end of it, 0, 1, and 2 so that you know the order in which these acquisitions took place, but they all have the same base file name that you can refer to that will make sense during analysis. So those are the three ways in continuous mode 
that you can store your data. Now we also have epic mode or epoch mode as it's sometimes pronounced. An epic is a period of time. And what you're doing in epic mode is you're defining specific periods of time in your, in your protocol, in your acquisition, that have a known name and a known duration. And you're going to let Biolab sort of control naming those files for you and automatically stopping at a set duration. We have something called the epic file editor in Biolab, which can let you change the names of the epics in your protocol and save epic files which contain those definitions, open new ones, and so on. If you press this edit button right here, you'll see the epic file editor come up. And you know, a typical protocol may consist of a baseline period at the beginning, followed by any number of tasks, and then a recovery period at the end. And using this editor, you can add epics, you can remove them, you can change their durations, and like I mentioned, you can save multiple epic files so that you can have multiple protocols running on the same system. All you have to do is come in here, open a different one, and you're good to go with that particular protocol. And when you do this, you're going to end up with the specified durations of data for each epic that you've defined in a file that's named after that particular epic. Okay, so there's a few more additional settings I mentioned that we skipped over at the top and I'm going to talk about right now. We have the update rate, which is not really a setting, but more of an indication that the screen is going to update once per second, and that's fixed in Biolab. The Bionex chassis is which Bionex hardware you're currently using for acquisition. Now, it's possible to have multiple Bionex units hooked up to the same computer, uh, sometimes we, we do have some other hardware offerings that people occasionally use and it's important to look at this and make sure that you're using the correct chassis that you intend to use for acquisition. It's especially important if you're using triggering or events to make sure that the, the hardware that you're triggering and events are plugged into is the one that's listed here. We have the chart history length, which is how much data is displayed on the screen at one time. Defaults to 10, and 10 is a pretty nice segment of data to see because you can see multiple cycles of, of various signals, but it's not too little data, uh, so you can really get a good picture of what's going on. The subject number is a unique, unique identifier for a subject. And the acquisition source allows you to switch between different sources of data. So in Biolab, you can collect data from just a Bionex, you can collect data from just a MIME or mobile. You can collect from both of them at the same time in case you have some modules in your Bionics you want to collect from and you also have the person hooked up to, uh, to a MIME or mobile. Or you can open a file using this control, which we'll talk about in a later webinar. So that concludes all the settings across the top of the screen. And now we're going to move into the channel setup portion. And that's always going to consist of the first or the first two tabs in this submenu. Depending on how many channels you have will determine how many tabs you have and how many options you have to choose from on the tabs. And again, we're going to sort of move from left to right, um, occasionally jumping around when it makes sense, but for the most part we're going to move left to right and talk about all the different options you have here. And starting with the on-off button. So, this is the button that you'll use to enable or disable your channels for acquisition. So you'll see when a channel is disabled, it's going to be grayed out. And when it's enabled, you're going to see a green light illuminated on the on-off button and all of the settings for that channel are going to be available to modify. So there are a couple ways the channels are referred to in the minor system. There's the channel type, which is shown in the Bionex slot column over here. And these are not modifiable. These are set by the system. And they give you a general idea of what that channel can be used for. So in this case, the first module I have is an impedance cardiograph. So the first channel is always used for ECG. The second and third are always used for impedance. And the fourth is always used for, for skin conductance. <clears throat> but there are some other channel types 
like channel 5 biopotential that are just generic biopotential channels. So you can't tell by looking at that necessarily what signals you're acquiring using it other than it's a biosignal. The same with transducers. We don't know what kind of transducer is plugged in, but we know that it's a transducer of some type, such as a PLE or a skin temp probe. The channel name column, on the other hand, is customizable. And you should always check this channel name to make sure that it makes sense to you for analysis purposes. Because if you just see transducer, you're not going to know necessarily months later when you go to analyze your data whether that was your PLE channel, whether that was your respiration belt, and so on. So it's important to label these channels based on the type of signal that's being acquired there so that you, you have that recognition when you go to analyze. Another example of when you would do this is if you have multi-subject studies, you have dyadic studies. Name them after the participant specifically that is being collected using that channel, so parent ECG, child ECG. Because when you have both subjects mixed in a file, it can get confusing unless you have them very clearly defined. Okay, we're going to skip scaling for a second and jump over to gain because we're going to be using the gain setting when we talk about scaling. So to understand gain, we need to know a little bit about the hardware that we're collecting the data with. So the hardware uses something called an analog to digital converter to digitize an incoming analog signal for use on a computer. And analog to digital converters have a known range of voltage that they can accept, they can digitize. And signals on the body can be low amplitude sometimes. Gain is signal amplification. It's taking that incoming signal, making it bigger, making it higher amplitude. And when we do that, the signal is going to take up more of the available range on the A to D converter, which is going to lead to improved overall signal resolution. But we don't want to amplify it too much, or else we'll exceed those limits and we'll end up losing data, which I'll illustrate with the next graphic. And just to mention, the Bionex has a voltage range of plus and minus 5 volts. So here we're going to take an example ECG signal, and we see the 5 volt and negative 5 volt limits of the Bionex. When the gain's too low and the signal is too small, you're still going to be able to use it, but you're going to lose some of the finer details because of the limited resolution that's being used to define it. A good gain setting uses about 60% of the overall A to D range. And the reason 60% and not more is because signals are going to change over time. There might be baseline wander, there might be value changes that are significant, and you don't want to lose those. You want to allow the signal to move around a bit in the overall range, and you don't want to limit it. And when the gain is too high, you're going to experience something called clipping, which is where the signal actually exceeds the limits, and it'll appear as though the top or bottom of your signal is missing. And when this happens, this is very bad because gain is one of the only things that you can't fix post-acquisition because it's a, it's a setting that affects the incoming data. So when this happens, you will actually lose data and it will not be recoverable. So it's always important to take a look at your data and make sure that at the top and bottom of your signal that you're seeing what you're expecting and not a flat line indicating that you're clipping the signal. So as I mentioned, um, and this is a good time to also mention that raw data is stored separately in our data files than the filtering, than the scaling, than any other processing that you do to the waveforms. But gain cannot be corrected post-acquisition because it's a hardware setting that's affecting how the data is collected in the first place. So always make sure you get this right. We do have a knowledge base article that contains the starting recommended gain settings for common signal types that we collect in Biolab. So please do go check out that knowledge base article on our support site if you have questions about that. If you're starting up a system, definitely take a look. And for the MindWare Mobile, the gain works a little differently. And you can typically leave the gain at one for most signals that you collect with it. OK, now that we've talked about gain, we can talk about scaling. 
So scaling is used to take a signal from volts to a more appropriate unit of measure, like ohms for impedance or microsiemens for skin conductance. And to do this, we're going to press this purple button here to open the scaling screen. And we have a couple scaling options that are available. Uh, one is slope intercept, the uh, y equals mx plus b equation. And when you're scaling EDA or impedance, m is equal to the gain. And when you're using skin, a skin temp probe, the scaling equation is a little more complicated, but it can still fit within the y equals mx plus b format. The other option we have is map ranges, which allows you to map a known voltage range to a certain set of units. And this is particularly useful with blood pressure calibration. So this screenshot, you wouldn't actually use this for, for skin conductance. You'd use this for something like blood pressure. And again, we have a knowledge base article that talks about how you'd use this specifically, but it, it involves using some calibration waveforms from the blood pressure machine, reading them in here, sending these to different values, and then you have your data in millimeters of mercury as opposed to volts. And the reason this is nice is if you're used to looking at data in known units, you're not going to know what voltage values are appropriate when collecting your data. So this helps put it in context for what you're used to seeing when you're, when you're looking at certain signals. And finally, once you've applied a scaling, you can now change the scaled unit from volts to whatever it is you're now scale, scaling it to. And BioLab doesn't automatically know this, so you have to tell it. So you can select from the list of units whatever unit is appropriate for this particular measure. And you can define a new unit. Um, and again, this is just for display purposes. So in the analysis applications, we're actually going to be scaling the data a little differently. So if you do this, it's really going to be for your own use in Biolab to make sure that your data is coming in correctly. And there's no problem with not scaling your data because in the analysis applications, you're going to end up being able to scale it again anyway. Um, one thing to note is that the MindWare Mobile data is already scaled for you. So if you're using a MindWare Mobile, you don't need to worry about that screen at all. Um, otherwise, scaling data can make it easier to determine if data is good quality. And, uh, and if it helps, then you should definitely use it. All right, we're going to move on to filtering now. And... The signals that we collect typically are complex waveforms that can be broken down into components of varying frequencies and magnitudes. And what filtering does is it allows us to isolate the frequency content that we care about and remove the frequency content that we don't care about, such as noise. So there are four main types of filters that we have in Biolab. Low pass, high pass, band pass, and band stop. What low pass does is it passes all of the frequencies up to a known frequency value. High pass passes all frequencies above a frequency value. Band pass allows for a range of frequencies to be passed. And band stop removes the frequencies within a range. And in Biolab, we have numerous other filter types that are catered specifically to types of signals that are commonly collected in Biolab. Because we know the frequency range that we care about on an ECG signal or an impedance signal or a skin conductance signal, and we know certain types of noise that we might like to remove, like 60 hertz noise caused by electrical interference. And so we have a number of predefined filters that are just named after those signal types that you can select is a good starting point for determining if a filter is needed on a particular signal. And to help illustrate this a little bit, there's a graphic here that shows the different types of filters and, and what they're doing to different frequency values. So our 60 hertz notch at the top here is cutting out frequencies around 60 hertz or 50 hertz if you're in a different country in the United States. Our EDA filter is passing low frequencies because EDA is a very low frequency signal. 
So we don't care about higher frequency noise that could end up being misinterpreted as a skin conductance response. We only care about the slow moving parts. So we're going to limit our signal to that. Same with ECG. Um, by setting a bandpass filter starting at 0.5 hertz, we're removing baseline wander and we're going to make it easier on the peak detection algorithms to identify our beats. And with EMG, we care about a wide range of frequencies, which is why we have a bandpass filter set at a very wide range of frequencies. Let's take, for example, a signal that is suffering from 60 hertz noise. And this is actually a pretty minor example of 60 hertz noise. I've seen situations where the noise is so great that you can barely see the R peaks above the noise band. But in any case, I could see that on this ECG signal, there is some noise present. And without going too far into it, if we were to look at the power spectrum, which is a representation of the frequency content of the signal, we can see that there's a lot of power right around 60 hertz, which is indicative of 60 hertz noise. So we would remove that by applying a 60 hertz notch filter. And when we do that, we can see that the data is significantly cleaner. And we can also see in the power spectrum that the noise that was once present at 60 hertz is no longer a factor. So that's how filtering works. And much like all the other processing that's done to signals in Biolab, filtering is only applied to the raw data in software after the fact. So if you apply a filter that destroys your signal or is you know, removing too much frequency content from your signal, you can always change it or remove it after the fact and it won't affect the raw data at all. You also shouldn't automatically apply filters. It's easy to see that you're collecting ECG and there's an ECG filter, so let's just apply it. Because you don't necessarily need it. You should look at the quality of your data and determine, is this data scorable? Is this data good? And, and, and if it doesn't look great, you can try applying a filter and see if that cleans it up. Maybe it will. Maybe there's other issues at play, such as electroconductivity. But in any case, you should always look at your raw data and then make an informed decision as to whether or not you apply a filter. Because filters can not only do good, but they can also do bad. They can reduce the amplitude of your signal. If they're too drastic, they can result in a phase shift, which can affect some of your timing statistics. So definitely look first. And much like with scaling, the analysis applications have built-in signal-specific filters. And in some cases, like EMG or HRV, there are multiple filters that you can apply to an ECG signal or an EMG signal as opposed to the one filter that you're allowed to apply in Biolab. So, if you don't filter your data in Biolab, you'll have another opportunity to do so with very specific filters that are designed for the type of analysis you're doing once you start using the analysis applications. And the final setting that's available on the channel setup portion is the preview button. And this might be the most important thing that we talk about all day because it's extremely important to preview your data before you acquire it. Always do this because it'll help identify situations where data quality is not sufficient for analysis before you ever start acquiring your data. Once you get to the acquisition screen, once you're seeing the data, it's being acquired. It's being stored into a file. And so you have less troubleshooting opportunities at that point than you would if you used the preview screen. So if we go to the preview screen, you'll see what I mean. When, we, when we're on the preview screen, we can not only see the raw data unprocessed, but we can also see the effects caused by scaling, and the effects caused by filtering, and the effects caused by wave math, which we didn't talk about. And the reason I didn't talk about it is because it's not super useful. It allows you to add and subtract channels from one another or differentiate or integrate them live. But this information is only used in Biolab and it's not really used in any of our analysis applications, so it's not a very commonly used feature. It is there if you'd like to use it, but that's what that is. In any case, if you come in here to the preview screen, you can see the effects of all the different processing that you're doing on your data, and you can also just see your data. You can see what it looks like, if it's looking like it's good quality, 
if it's looking like there's a lot of movement artifact or poor connectivity with an electrode, and you can deal with all those issues before you get into your protocol. It's going to make life a lot easier and less stressful when you're trying to figure out these problems and when you go back and analyze your data and its quality. So just to recap, you can use the preview screen to see the effects of all of your processing in real time so you can make informed decisions about what gain you use, what filtering you use, and what scaling you use. You can use it to check the signal morphology to make sure that good electrode contact is made, and you should also know what good signal looks like. So we're working on developing a database of good signal examples, which will eventually be available on our support site, but for the time being, take a screenshot of good data when you see it. Keep it in your lab so that anyone who's using Biolab can go to that preview screen, look at their data, compare it to a reference signal, and, and be confident that they're getting good data. Always preview your data. Okay, so that concludes the walkthrough portion of the webinar. So at this point, we're going to move into a question and answer portion. So I'm going to take a moment to look at all the questions that have come in over the course of the webinar, and I'll be responding. I know there's a lot that we didn't cover in this webinar about Biolab, and that's because this is the first part of a planned series on Biolab so that we can go into all the features in the detail that they require. So be on the lookout for another webinar part two coming up soon where we'll deal with events and audio video and actual data acquisition. So I'll be right back with some questions. Okay, we've got a question. Does Biolab work on a MacBook? So MindWare software is not Mac OS compatible, but you can always run Windows on a Mac and use MindWare software. But I wouldn't recommend using virtual machines to do any live acquisitions because you won't necessarily have the processing power that you need. Okay, we've got a question about the 60 hertz notch filter. So the type of filter that we're using there is a band stop. But in Biolab, we actually have a 60 hertz notch filter type that you can choose that will automatically fill in the low and high cutoff. So when we talk about the filters, um, we, we have two parameters for each filter, a low cutoff and a high cutoff. And depending on the filter type that you choose, you'll have either a low cutoff or a high cutoff or both. And in the case of a 60 hertz notch filter, it is a band stop, so you'll have both a low and a high because you're defining a range of frequencies which you'll cut out. And we automatically, using the 60 hertz notch filter, take out from 50 to 70 hertz. OK, I have another question. Is it safe to upgrade Biolab in the middle of a study? Yes, it's safe. Um, Typically, in Biolab, we add features um, and we, we fix bugs, but none of it affects the way the data is stored. So your data is going to be stored the same way. Uh, the only thing to take into consideration when you do update is that sometimes between major versions, at least, the settings will not persist. So when you install a new version, you're going to have a blank slate and you'll have to reconfigure your application. Now, one of the advantages of 3.3 is that we've added this new um, and improved user configuration um, functionality where you can export a user configuration from an earlier version of Biolab down to 3.1 and import that into 3.3 and it'll restore all of your settings. So that makes upgrading a little easier. And another thought to keep in mind is that with Biolab 3.1 and greater, we changed file formats. So now we have um, the MWX and MWI files, which make up a data record for Mindware. And previ previously, we had a Mindware file, just .mw. And if you're using 3.0 analysis applications, they're only capable of reading that .mw file format. So they're not capable of reading data from Biolab 3.1 and beyond. So the only other consideration to make is what version of analysis are you on? And as long as you're on 3.1 analysis, then you can upgrade to any version of Biolab and you'll be able to use that data no problem. Okay, I've got another question about should you apply filters during acquisition 
or during analysis, and what's the benefit of doing it during acquisition. So if you apply filters in acquisition, it's going to help you see the signal more clearly that you're connecting, collecting. So if your signal is particularly noisy, even if that filter is not going to be used in analysis, applying that filter during acquisition can help clear it up for you so that, so that you can see that you do have, in fact, good signal that is usable, albeit with a filter applied. Now, even though the BioLab filters aren't automatically used in analysis, there is an option in the analysis applications to turn those on as well. So if you go, I think, to the, files, to the file menu and then to scaling and filtering in the analysis applications, you can, you can turn on that BioLab filter. I might be able to pull that up here. Okay, so if you're in the analysis applications and you've applied a filter in BioLab that you want to continue using, this is the same for all applications, not just HRV. You come up the file and scaling and filtering settings, and in here there's a use filter settings button, and you can enable it or disable it. By default, it's disabled because a lot of the filters that you would apply in BioLab are also applied in the analysis applications. But if you were to apply a filter in BioLab that was needed in analysis, you can always come in here and use your BioLab filter. So there's a question about how much BioLab costs. Um, it's actually free, um, but it does require you to have some sort of mindware data acquisition equipment to use it. So if you have a Bionex or a Mindware Mobile, then, then BioLab will just come free with it and you can use it to acquire your data and view it. And if you just have some mindware data that you would like to view and you don't have any data acquisition equipment, you can always download BioLab from our support site and, and use it for free. So I have a question about what signals you can acquire in BioLab. Um, so there are a lot of different signals you can acquire in BioLab. We have an impedance cardiograph module, which allows you to collect ECG, cardiac impedance, and skin conductance. We have general purpose bioamplifiers, which can collect a number of things, such as respiration, ECG, EMG. We have a transducer module, which allows you to interface with various transducers such as a PLE or a finger, finger plethysmography. We have ear PLEs. We have respiration belts, skin temperature probes. We have a rating dial system, which you can use to, to rate a value uh, within a certain range. Uh, basically, if you take a look at our website, you could see the different offerings we have in terms of Bionex modules, as well as the capabilities of our MIMER mobile. And that can let you know sort of what data you can collect. But the answer is quite a bit. And much like all of our other webinars, this webinar video will be available for use shortly after it's finished, probably in the next few days. And uh, they're all linked from our support site. So if you go to our support site and you look at training materials, you can see every webinar that we've ever conducted in its entirety and segmented by, by topic that was covered within the webinar. That's also available on our YouTube page. Okay, I have a question about, does BioLab work with wired and wireless systems? The answer is yes, it does. So we talked a little bit about acquisition source. So there are three different sources that you can acquire data from in BioLab. We have the Bionex, which is our desktop hardware, which is wired. We have ambulatory Wi-Fi mode, which is using a Mindware mobile, it's wireless. And then we can do both simultaneously. So let's say that you have a person hooked up to a Mimer mobile, but you also want to collect continuous blood pressure using a transducer module on the Bionex. You can collect the blood pressure on the Bionex and the physiology on the Mimer mobile at the same time. Okay, I have a question about whether you can use two Bionexes with the same BioLab. And the answer is sort of yes and no. So you can only acquire data from a single a desktop hardware source at once. So one Bionex can be used to collect physiology. But if you're using Mindware video encoders and you have multiple Bionexes with video encoders in them, you can use all the video encoders from all of your separate systems. And I mentioned earlier that that Bionex chassis field was important to make note of if you have multiple desktop units that you're using at the same time. Uh, we have something called the Wireless Data Center, which is sort of a, it, it's a rack mount router and AV solution. And occasionally those are used alongside Bionexes. And if you don't have your Bionex selected, 
then you won't be able to collect the physiology from a Bionex. It'll appear as though there are no channels available to you. Um, and that's if you have your source chosen as the as the wireless data center. So in that situation, you just need to redetect your devices, choose the Bionex, um, and we're going to talk about detecting devices in a future webinar as well. Okay, I have another question. Can Biolab trigger other acquisition systems such as EEG or E-Prime? And it can. The Bionex also has a trigger out port. Let me get back to that picture here. So right below the trigger import is a trigger out port. And we actually just released a knowledge base article that describes the functionality of the trigger out port. Essentially what it does, and this sort of depends on which Bionex you have, but if you have a newer Bionex, the way it works is anytime an acquisition is started, there's going to be a pulse sent out the trigger out port of 50 milliseconds. And that can be sent to any external system that's waiting to accept the trigger to, to be used to start acquisition on that system. If you have an older version of a Bionex, it works a little differently. It just mirrors whatever's coming in the trigger inline. But you can still use the Bionex to, to route a trigger through it to another system. Okay, I have another question. Um, what, if, what if they forget to set scaling on the impedance channels? Can you still use the data? And the answer is yes. You, your raw data is always preserved. And it's never saved, scaled, or filtered, or anything like that. So in the impedance application, scaling is applied to it in a different way. And, and you can always change those settings after the fact, and, and it won't impact your ability to analyze the data at all. And if you wanted to open the file in Biolab and look at it scaled, you can always open the file later and, and apply that scaling to the file and view the data in the appropriate units. Okay, so that concludes all the time we had today for the webinar. So thank you very much for coming out. And again, please do check out our support site, um, support.mindwaretech.com. It contains uh, quite the database of helpful information when it comes to using our applications, understanding some of the science, and it's, it's an ever-growing resource. So please do check that out. And again, thank you, and be on the lookout for an announcement about part two of this webinar series in the near future. Have a great day.